Good morning, Sullivan County. My name's Karen Black. Um, and you just saw this amazing presentation on these beautiful active places with lots of color and excitement, and that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, I'm here to talk about the deteriorated places, the problem properties, the places that once were great, but that might have been 50 years ago, the places that we really don't have a purpose for right now. And um, I've been doing this work for about 20 years. And I want to start by saying that we know a lot, right? Brian kind of said this is a nascent area. We're just learning. This is one of a kind. That's not our situation with respect to blight, right? I grew up in Rochester, New York. Everyone's father worked for Kodak, Xerox, Bausch & Lama, French's Mustard. And those jobs don't exist anymore. Um, I currently live in Philadelphia, where uh, we lost a quarter of our population. So picture a city of two million that lost a half a million people and what that looks like. And we still have more houses than households to fill them, right? And I'm working in rural areas around Easton and Bethlehem and Northampton County in Pennsylvania, and there was the slate belt, right? All those blackboards, all that slate we needed, and now we just have empty quarries that are being used uh, to dump waste in, some legally, some illegally. Um, and of course, the big Bethlehem steel site. So um, for years, I was working primarily in they're now calling them legacy communities. I actually hate the term, so I shouldn't yeah. use it, which means that places that have changed so substantially, their industries, um, their main businesses, their economic development, that um, they're looking back at the past, right? Their legacy. Um, but with the Great Recession in 2008, I started getting calls from the Twin Cities in Minnesota, from Oakland, California, because they were seeing blight and vacant properties for the first time. And they wanted to learn from us. And that's when I first got this interest in like, let, what do we know? Because as all of you know, you can do the same thing over and over without having any real knowledge as to where, whether it has an impact. So let me start by saying that things have changed tremendously now from 20 years ago. And as I go into cities and towns, let me tell you what I'm not hearing. I am no longer hearing, this is not government's problem. I am no longer hearing, let's wait until the market catches up. The market isn't catching up, right? You have to proactively redefine your markets. I am no longer hearing that people have property rights. They can do whatever they darn well please on their property. Because the reality here is that you can up to the point it hurts other people, right? I have the right to extend my fist but only so far as it doesn't hit you in the nose. And since I'm really short, it's more like the stomach. But still, the concept's there, right? And, um, and that's really important, because that person who has weeds that are two foot high and three non-working vehicles in their front yard, and you can see the gutters falling off their home, are not just hurting their own property values. They're hurting everyone's around them. Right, And that's really important to know. And then finally, um, I'm no longer hearing of code enforcement like it's a bureaucratic, unimportant function. Code enforcement officials are first responders. They are really, really important. And in every place I've worked, and I just want you to hear this if you hear nothing else, and I've worked probably in 50 communities, maybe more. I never counted them up. Code enforcement is a profit maker. Code enforcement is self-financing. Code enforcement should not be a burden on government. It also shouldn't be a burden on good property owners who are taking care of their properties. But with things like vacant property registration, right, which Binghamton has and Newburgh has, this idea that if you have a long-term vacant property, you are responsible for registering it with government and registering the plan for how you're going to reactivate it. 
because mothballing a property so it harms the whole community is not your right. It violates code. There are things you can do. Okay, so that's the context. This should be a shocking number, and these studies have been done in rural places around the country, but I use this one because I did it, you know, you just have to. So if you are going to make changes in blight in your communities, I would argue that the first thing you need to do is make very clear to all of your elected officials and all government staff that the status quo is not an option. It costs a lot of money to leave blighted properties alone. So for Philadelphia, it costs $20 million every year. That's direct costs. What is that? That's every time the fire department has to go out, every time the police department has to go out. In some of the communities I work in, the deteriorated vacant properties are 30% of the calls. And I hate to tell you, but when you look at firefighter deaths around the country, it is these blighted, deteriorated properties that are most likely the cause. It's, it, it costs you money, and it brings down the property values for everyone surrounding it substantially. And when it does that, that means less revenue for government in taxes. That means less revenue for school districts. So there's a real cost in not taking care of things. But also the research shows there is this huge upside when you do take care of it. So when you eliminate blight, it reduces crime. And when I'm talking about reducing crime, I'm saying that in jurisdictions that took lots with high weeds, with uh, litter and dumping, and they just got rid of all the waste, they just greened and mowed the lawn, maybe they put a little picket fence around it, that that was enough to bring gun violence in that area down 38%. All crime, 19%. Why? Part of it is because people are not comfortable committing crimes in places that look well tended. There's other reasons too we'll talk about. It improves the health of residents, right? Brian talked a lot about what we all need to be healthy, but this is a great study that I really loved. So what they did was uh, the researchers had people stroll by blighted properties. And then they got money, a grant, to fix up those blighted properties, just on the exterior, so they no longer, right, they were all well tended. And then they had the same people walk by them. And they had heart monitors on them. And the reality is that when you're walking down your main street and you're passing a vacant storefront that's dilapidated and deteriorated, your heart rate goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. It happened universally. Even folks who had lived there for long times and had, quote, gotten used to it, once those places were fixed up, their health improved. And of course, health improves for all the reasons that Brian talked about, that you want to be in these spaces, you want to be doing things, you want to be active. It raises surrounding property values by up to 30%. 30% on property values is enough to pay towards a retirement, towards your kid's college. If you're in an area that has a lot of dilapidated and deteriorated properties, they are hurting you really very specifically, right? And of course it increases tax revenue. So um, what we have found that works is strategic code enforcement. And I wanna just start there because it is not complaint-driven code enforcement. And that's really important because complaint-driven code enforcement is not as effective not as fair, and costs a lot more money. So let's just start, uh, Denise started this talking about potholes. So let's assume you're a local government fixing potholes and you've decided on a complaint-driven approach. So you go out, because Ethel called about a pothole, you fill that pothole, you may pass 10 potholes along the way, but you don't touch those, there's no complaint. And then you wait until there's a complaint and then you go fill that pothole. 
right? And your people are crossing the town back and forth and back and forth rather than just systematically going through. And that's not fair, right? Because if there isn't an Ethel who's on the phone to her government all the time complaining, then those folks are going to live with potholes. The other problem is for the average person, it's kind of like not inspecting residents until someone calls with a complaint of food poisoning, right? You wait until the damage is done, certainly with respect to lead paint, right? Which we know um, if there is lead paint in a home with small children and in areas like this with older housing stock, it's just, it's there. Um, and if you wait till it's in the blood, then you're talking about a decrease in their IQ, you're talking about a decrease in their behavior, you're talking about an increased chance that they will be involved in criminal behavior, right? Getting to these things quickly uh, really makes sense. So strategic code enforcement is going place to place to place, however many years it takes, and saying these are the basic code requirements. And before you do this, I have to say, what you want to do is educate all the property owners and explain to them why this is important. You aren't out to get them. Explain what the most common and most disconcerting code violations are. Um, when you do this for the first time, you're going to provide warnings. One um, jurisdiction I worked with uh, started with these formal letters that they were leaving on the porch, which was like, we have found three code violations. You must fix them immediately or else, right? And people didn't like that. Um, so they switched door hangers. And they had pretty door hangers that said, this is a great neighborhood and we want it to be greater. So here's what we noticed about your place. Could you fix it? And if you have questions about how you can get the resources to fix us, call us. And suddenly, there was just this huge response. Um, it should be uh, proactive, systematic. It should include a database of all properties. And this is really important. So many jurisdictions do not know what they have. They don't know how many foreclosed properties are owned by the banks or which bank, right? And we all went through a, a recession together, and there's a lot of foreclosed properties. They don't know where the vacant properties are. They don't know which properties are being rented long term. They certainly don't know which properties are being rented short term as Airbnbs. Knowing who's out there, what they're doing, and what the condition of the property is really important. And once you have it in a database, it's important. The other thing that's really important is that I hear over and over and over and over that even when code enforcement is good and proactive, that the judges and magistrates don't back them up. So you go out there, you say, yep, you violated this, and you bring it to a judge, and they say, yeah, you know, I got more important things bigger fish to fry. Once you have a database, then you can actually track all of that owner's properties and bring it to a judge. And we just had a situation, I recommended this to somebody, and they said, we brought their nine properties in, which were all in terrible shape, because this owner just was waiting for the, the market to shift. He wanted that windfall. He believed his properties would be worth millions one day, and his way of dealing with it is not investing a cent, just leaving it blighting his community, and then 10, 15 years later, it was going to pay for his retirement. And went before this judge with this whole package, right, and said, here are the nine properties. And the guy said, judge, I am poor. I have no money. I can't fix up these properties. I'd like to, but I can't. And the judge said, OK, let's sell six of them. Maybe that'll be enough money to fix up the other three. It changed the conversation, right? Um, and it also changes the culture. And this is really, really important, right? If, in fact, people believe that it is their property to do with what they will, and they are allowed to keep it in any state they, they themselves feel comfortable with, or some of them have stopped seeing it, right? They don't even notice. Um, then 
we've got a problem. And so what we want to do is we want to say, you know what? We are growing this economy. We are improving this community. Come join us. And this is what we're asking you to do because it isn't acceptable. And almost everything I'm going to talk about for the rest of my time here, quite frankly, is about getting an owner to move from, I'm ignoring you, to how fast you need me to do it. And that means some very hard things for code enforcement officers. And I know there are some of you in the room. And I have to tell you, you know that door hanger town, a rural town in Pennsylvania called Aetna? Um, they ended up contracting out for code enforcement. And the reason why they did that was because their code enforcement person who'd been in the job for years and years and years was 70 years old. He knew everyone. And there was no way he was going to cite his cousin. And when they put pressure on him to cite his cousin, he said, I can't do that. Like, I've got to live in this community. And they said, OK, so we're going to do a systematic look at every property's condition, and we're going to hire outsiders to do it. But then you've got to back it up, right? And you've got to tell your cousin. Interestingly, they then brought in the code enforcement guys from outside, and they said, OK, we're going to get you a lot of violations. And they said, no, 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 that, we don't want a lot of violations. We just want these properties fixed up. That is our goal. And they said, we sent out a flyer saying, you're going to be coming, and this is what you're going to be looking for. The guy said, no, no, no. Then they'll improve things before I get there. And they said, this isn't the code enforcement guy for us either, right? We want them to improve things. We aren't trying to penalize anybody. We want action. So um, what I have found is there is no one magic bullet to deal with blight. If there was one tool that would fix everything, that would be fantastic. But there isn't. So in Pennsylvania, I created a uh, book that basically sets out every tool that's legal under state law, who's using it, how they're using it, in what situations. And I'm hoping to do one for Delaware very soon. But the idea is to learn from other communities under the same legal framework as you and to know what the cost is. And that's really important because to say pie in the sky, go out to every single property, how are you going to fund that? It's really important to know. And the first thing is to have a law in place. If you do not have a law that says it is illegal to keep three non-functioning automobiles in your front yard, then you cannot use code enforcement. You need to have a law. And the International Property Maintenance Code, which is updated every three years, is a very good one. It only deals with the exterior of homes, and it deals with all of those things that make a place look terrible, that attracts rodents and other vermin that cause trouble. And it also creates a list of fines and penalties for those who do not take care of their properties. And this is really important. And then I would argue there's two categories of tools. So the first are, like, we want to know about every property in our communities, what condition they're in, who owns them, what they've done, what they have the capacity to do, and what they need. And then we're going to try to help, and we'll talk about some things to help and incentives, and we're going to enforce. But then there are those property owners who are not going to do what you tell them to do. And it does not matter if you have the law in place. And in places that I work, they will say, if you have three code violations, it is a criminal misdemeanor, and you will spend a year in jail. Whoopee. No one has ever spent a year in jail. No one has any expectation that they will spend a year in jail. So it's irrelevant, right? I, how many people here are parents? OK? How many of you have said to your kid, if you do that, you are going to your room until you go to college, right? And yet, it's dinner time, and you call them down to the table, right? That threat has absolutely no meaning. 
So it's about having a law, but it's also about making clear and enforcing that law. And in one jurisdiction where they used a hall of shame, have you guys heard of the hall of shame? I kind of like this. So what they would do is they would feature a property owner who had a series of really, really bad properties, kind of the worst of the worst. And the newspaper worked with them and the local TV station. So suddenly, Sal is front page of the paper. He's being featured as the worst slumlord, the worst property owner, right? And before that happens, they say, Sal, we just want you to know, we've been asking you now for a year to fix this up. And the paper just asked us for the worst property owner who's harming our area the most, and we sort of had to give him your name. So will you work with me to fix him up? And then Sal says, no, right? And whenever they did that, what they found was Sal was a lost cause at this point, because now Sal had undergone all that bad publicity, but they got a dozen phone calls from property owners going, you wouldn't do that to me, would you? What do I need to do today to make sure that you never do that to me, right? It changed the rules, it changed the culture, there was accountability. There has to be accountability if you have long-term properties that are not being cared for because as communities, it's time to say we will not accept that blight and vacant properties are just part of our communities and we have to accept it. The reality is we don't. So where enforcement fails, you need to have other tools. And New York has several of these tools, and it does not have others. And so part of it is knowing what tools you can use under state law, and part of it is adding laws. So let me just give you some examples. Asset attachment. In Pennsylvania, if you have liens on your property, if you have code violation penalties, you are personally liable for them. What does that mean? That means that when you have a very, very nice house that you take care of, and yet you've left your mother's house that was willed to you in terrible condition, paid no mind to it, that we can say, hi, we're gonna actually take the value from your other house in order to pay for all those liens and all those years we've been mowing and caring for the property you didn't take care of. We can also Get your wages. We are saying you are personally responsible. Uh, eminent domain, um, Cumberland County in Pennsylvania, very similar to the area around us, um, different industries. They decided to bring 100 eminent domain claims. Now, eminent domain, for those of you who have been, it is a painful legal process. You're taking someone's property from them. It takes forever. So, and it's costly. So why did they do this? Because no one was paying attention and they needed to change the culture. They brought 100 condemnation actions, 100 eminent domain actions. Guess how many settled? 95. They either sold the property to someone else because they didn't want the headache, or they fixed it because they didn't want to risk losing the property and it had value to them. The other five out of that 100, they had to go through the whole process. And it was expensive, but now when you divide it by 100. And no one is messing with them anymore, right? They've proven that it's valid. Conservatorship or receivership, really important, this idea that a government doesn't have to take liability for property. The court can appoint someone who's going to fix it up and get paid back because they're either going to rent that property out or sell it. Um, and land banks um, are springing up all across the country, certainly all across New York. They absolutely fit my mantra of there is no magic bullet, but they can be so helpful. Because one of the things we're seeing with blight around the country is it's no one's job. Blight is not the fire department's job. It's not the planning department's job, right? It, it really starts escaping notice until the problem gets worse and worse and worse. So having a land bank that does two things. One, it's their job. And two, they take control of the land and make sure it goes from a bad actor 
to a good actor. And that may seem simple, but in most of our communities, most of the properties that are taken are taken for lack or failure to pay taxes. And when you put foreclosed properties into the system and bring them to tax sale, and they go to other bad actors, you haven't achieved anything. In fact, most of them will cycle back through foreclosure and back to tax sale. And we've looked at places across the country, and there's good research to show that's what happens. That the people who are bidding for them are not the people who have the capacity and interest in reactivating them. And so now you've taken a property from a bad actor who's blighted into your community. You've gone through a whole process. The high bidder at auction takes it. They leave it in bad condition until it becomes foreclosed again. And then you're into cycle three, and it's harming the community again and again. Land banks stop that cycle. They also can assemble land into developable sites, which is really critically important when you've got one property here, one property there, one property there, if you want to really uh, deal with this at scale. And it is really important, we found, to bring everybody together. So this kind of gathering is so important because it isn't someone's job. And so if you bring the judicial system and the public safety system and community stakeholders together and they're all going to work together on it, you have so much better chance of being successful. The other thing that really increases your chance of success when dealing with problem properties or blight is to target the worst of the worst. Be strategic. Those communities that have basically thrown funding at properties like seeds, hoping for them to grow, have not been successful. We've looked at that. If you say, I have 100 properties I would like dealt with, and I have very few resources, but I'm going to try to deal with all of them, it doesn't work. So you pick the first five, and you put all your weapons that you have at your disposal to try to get those properties back in good condition, reactivated, not harming anyone around them. And when you're successful, then you move on to the next five properties. But it's very, very important that you have a focus. The other thing we found is that the cheapest, most effective way to deal with a property that is blighted is to deal with it when the owner wants something from you. OK, all these people who are parents in the audience. Um, if you tell your teenager to take out the garbage when they are watching, in my case, an Eagles game on television, what is the chance that they will immediately get up and take out that garbage for you? Yep, yeah, yeah, ma, got it, got it, got it, later. That's not the time to ask. When they come and they say, can I have the car? And I say, can you take out the garbage? That garbage is out of there so quickly, right? They want something from me. And by the way, I don't waste those moments on just garbage, right? There's some room cleaning. There's big projects to be done. Same with owners. When they come to you because they want something, this is your moment. So permit denial. If they come to you because they want to put a nice deck on their beautiful house, but they have three blighted properties that they've assembled that are just, they haven't put any investment in, you say, no, sorry, we can't give you the permit until all of your properties are code compliant. It works. Pre-sale inspections, very, very helpful with out-of-state owners. You know, it's very hard to get at owners who you don't have jurisdiction over, right? You aren't going to get your governor to prioritize it and get them brought into town in handcuffs. It just doesn't work. But when they want to sell something and you say, before you sell it, you need to have an inspection, list all the problems for the buyer so they know what's facing them, or fix them so that you are only selling code compliant properties. That is an opportunity. And then registration. I talked about how Newburgh and Binghamton have this. This idea of, yeah, 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 I know, it was a gas station. Yep, 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 tanks underground, expensive. Hear ya, fine. 
this is a long-term vacant property, what is your plan and what is your timeline? And San Diego was the first one to do this and what happens is people actually respond and they start thinking and they're also told that there's gonna be consequences if they do not. Now, vacant property registration has been upheld in courts across the country because property owners have, have, have brought it to the courts and said, you can't charge me just because it's a vacant property. I am a property owner. I have the right to do whatever I want with my property. In this case, I want to do nothing and just let it fester and become an eyesore and hurt all of my neighbors. And the courts have said, no, you don't. Local government has an extraordinary power to address blight. Really important. So once you register, so Binghamton and Newburgh do fairly small amounts of money each year to register vacant properties. Minneapolis, a court just upheld $6,000 per year per vacant property. That's how much you have to pay. Why? Because government showed that they're mowing those properties, they're going to deal with vermin on those properties, they have huge and significant costs to address them, and code enforcement should be self-financing. The properties that are costing local government money should pay. And before you say this idea of systematically going, right, from house to house and commercial property to commercial property is impossible because there's too many, I would say that there are not. That very large cities have taken five to seven years, but they've gone to each and every one, put them in their database, and they now understand who's a renter, who's a homeowner, which properties are vacant, and they can take the appropriate action to make sure the conditions of each help the community, don't harm the community. So in doing so, right, Sacramento, from 2008 to 2013, they had a team of code enforcement officers three days a week going from property to property, right? These are rental properties and they were going inside, but they reduced dangerous buildings by 22%. Greensboro, North Carolina, where I'm going back to in a couple weeks, um, they reduced their housing complaints by 61% and brought all their properties up to code. I also want to talk about Philly, my hometown, for a second, because, and I'm a lawyer by training, I should say that, so I really love when owners bring these cases to court and you have a court ruling and saying, yep, you can do that. Makes me feel much more comfortable, much more confident. So Philadelphia, at one point, had 60,000 vacant properties. Talk about scale, right? 60,000. And they're argument was that everyone had to board up those properties. And most people use plywood, and then government would have to go out over and over because somebody would pry off the plywood. And, uh, n you know, talk about the curb appeal of a commercial property that you're walking by with plywood just in the doors. So Philadelphia very strategically said, we have to change the culture. And they came up with this idea. They said, Every single structure has to, with blocks that have at least 80% occupancy. So these are not, you know, Philly has some shelled out areas where nobody's living. But 80% occupancy, you have to put in working doors and windows. Because we think that's going to make a difference. And for every day you don't do that, we're going to charge you $300 per opening. So if you picture a Philly row house for a second, they typically have six openings. Three windows up top, two windows on the bottom, one door. That's $1,800 a day. And it keeps adding up. Now, again, Philly's goal was not to collect that money. And it certainly wasn't to penalize the owners. It was to stop them from saying, I'm gonna ignore you, and get them to say, how fast do you need me to move? And it worked. And it worked really, really well. And uh, what the court did is they established their own, what the city did, established their own blight court. And that just basically meant taking one magistrate and assigning them 
one day a week only to these cases. And the courts agreed to do that. So it's called blight court, but it's really an assigned judge. And what they found was that long-term vacant structures, the owners fixed them up, increased their prices by 74 million. I know this is a different scale, but it's an important scale. Increased tax revenue for the city by 2.34 million. Reduced gun violence and provided fees to fund the whole process so it was self-financing. And last week, the court decision came down and they said, of course the city can do that. Property owners do not have the right to stick plywood on their properties and say, yep, I've done my part. It affects health, it affects safety, it affects the community. So I want to talk for two seconds about problem properties and then two seconds about owner-occupied properties and talk about my passion project, which I think can really work in communities to deal with property owners who really care about their property and want to fix it up but don't have the resources. And, um, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So problem rental properties, there are several ways to deal with them. You know, I talked about vacant property, rental or vacant property registration, but rental property registration is important too, right? Rental properties are a business. They need a business license. They need to register. It's really important to know where your tenants are and what kind of conditions they're living in. So there are four um, types of registration, and I'm for the last one, so we're going to... We're going to ramp up and I'll tell you what it is. So the first is, you just ask owners to register. Tell us if you're a landlord and you're renting out a property. The second is, do that, but also we are going to regularly inspect. And um, the third is, we are going to give you a rental license. You register with us, we are going to give you a rental license, and we have the ability to take away that license if your property has substantial code violations and you have not addressed them. It is not just your right to be a landlord. And then the final one is that you actually use that little database, which can just be an Excel spreadsheet from all those code enforcement reviews, and you actually say, we're gonna treat you differently if you're a good landlord than if you're a bad landlord. Um, and what it does is it says, First of all, you know who your landlords are. You can get them in a room. You can send them something and say, guess what, the law changed. Or guess what, we're really concerned about this. Or guess what, we are giving away free recycling bins. Or guess what, we're having a training. It approves, improves the communication back and forth. And you can provide different incentives and rewards for landlords as well as penalties. Um, and it's really important when you're doing this to do two things. One is not punish the good landlords. Don't impose huge fines, fees, whatever, or requirements, and make it really cost effective for government because, right, we've got limited resources. So automating things and making it easy, we're gonna talk about that, outsourcing it, um, but this should not be, this isn't rocket science. Communities have been doing this now for decades. We can, I can get you an Excel spreadsheet that shows what you're checking off. We have the information, we know how to do this. And the idea is that you actually can adjust the inspection schedules depending on the type of property and the type of property owner. So, what does that mean? It means that you treat people differently but you do it legally because the state of their property is different. Code enforcement officers have been shown to waste half of their time. Code enforcement officers waste half of their time going to good properties. You get rid of that waste by knowing which are the properties that need constant supervision and which ones don't. And Minneapolis has this, but Brooklyn Center is, out, is a, a more rural area outside of Minnesota, um, outside of Minneapolis in Minnesota. And what they do is they rank their landlords on their properties. And for those in number four who are in the worst shape with tons of code violations, they're gonna go in every six months, they're gonna mandate that they get involved in training, 
and they're going to mandate that they create and give to government an action plan to take care of them over time. For the good ones, they can actually hire an inspector themselves, or you can say, hey, we're just going to come in every four years just to make sure things haven't gotten out of control. Again, if there's no complaints, right, because you can still complain. Okay, and then incentivize the good landlords as much as you can because we want good landlords, we want good property owners. Um, it's been really, really effective, and I have to say in dealing with rental properties, being creative is important. Um, in the same week that the, the courts in Pennsylvania said that the windows and doors program was legal, they also, um, came down with a decision about an owner, property owner, who tried to evict a tenant, but he wasn't registered with the city as a landlord. He hadn't paid any of the fees, he hadn't done anything. And the court said, you can't use my court to evict a tenant because you aren't legally a landlord. Guess those registrations are going up, right? In Seattle, they said, you can't increase rents if you have quality of life code violations that affect health and safety. Just can't do it, right? So again, it's about getting their attention. It's about changing the culture. It's about letting folks know there are consequences. Now, owner-occupied properties are very different because you cannot go into a homeowner's property without a warrant. But you can absolutely deal with the exterior. And, you know, I, I told you that Brian's pictures were gorgeous and mine were not. Ta-da! Right? But you've seen these properties, right? You, you drive by them and you're like, oh my, God, what a mess, right? So by changing the culture and letting them know that this isn't okay, you'll find there is some voluntary compliance. You also know that there's going to be consequences because you've changed that culture. And you may need to have some incentives. Now, what folks in Pennsylvania have done that has been very effective is quality of life ticketing. What they do is just like you get a ticket for parking your car in the wrong place or at the wrong time, or you'd swear it was the right place in the right time, but you still got a ticket. Um, quality of life ticketing is when the inspector goes, they don't take you to court, they leave you a ticket and say, we noticed that your gutters are detached. We noticed that you aren't mowing your lawn. This is your warning. Next, we'll be back. And at that point, there's going to be a fine. And just escalate things. And what folks like Cole Township in North Cumberland found was they provided tickets that kept increasing. Um, and they got, Allentown got 60% of the tickets paid. Cole Township got about 85% of the tickets paid, and they got them paid because there's also some peer pressure, right? Well, you don't want to be the property owner who doesn't take care of things because everyone knows, right, that they got ticketed. They had these beautiful neon pink uh, tickets. And I know this has been violated and used badly in, in New York City, but Nuisance properties really do need to be addressed to abate the nuisance, and the law allows you to do that. And uh, I can talk about that more if folks are interested. But I want to end with a real positive note around the Healthy Row House Project, which is my passion project that I've been working on for four years and I think can be very helpful. So um, in my hometown of Philly, uh, we have a really robust home repair grant program. The demand is here, the supply is here, right? Every year, the city runs out of money for home repair grants right around March. And then you got to wait, right, for the next year. And the average person is waiting on the home repair list for four years, right? Picture a dime-sized hole in the roof and then waiting four years. Right? By the time they get there, you've got enough water in the house that it's affecting the electricity, that there's mold growing on the walls that's affecting the asthma of children living there. You've got a problem, and probably the viability of the home. So what we did was we said, 
look, home is everything, right? And we really need to protect our affordable housing stock because these homes are old, but if an old home is tended to, it can last centuries, right? And so we said we can't afford to lose the existing homes. People are relying on them. And there's a whole bunch of studies. I could show you another 15 slides, but I won't, um, showing that for seniors, it means they're going to die sooner. Uh, for children, it means that they may not be breathing, or they may not be able to think, or they may, right? It all affects how you live, and it affects the healthcare industry because they can't even discharge a patient because they don't have a safe place to go to when they go back home. And so what we did is we looked at who needed the home repairs and who was getting them. And what we found in our city was that in two years, 24,000 homeowners applied to banks, private market lenders, for home improvement loans. And 67% were turned down. They wanted to get the capital. They couldn't access the capital. And the main reason was their credit scores. Sometimes their income, but their credit scores. So what we did was we encouraged Philadelphia, and we've had some success, to create a loan guarantee program where the city guarantees that the loan will be paid back and said to the lenders, right now you're only giving money to folks who make 660 credits, to who have credit scores of 660 or above. We want you to go down to 580. And in doing so, you're going to open up credit and capital to 25% of Philadelphia homeowners who can't get it now, 25%. We stole the idea, I love stealing ideas, from Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Now, Cleveland Heights was outside of Cleveland. You know, Cleveland isn't doing too well. Cleveland Heights wasn't doing too well. They struck an agreement 40 years ago with Key Bank. They said, we're going to put a certificate of deposit, a CD, in your bank for $160,000 to guarantee any loan that you give to our homeowners. And after 40 years, that has actually produced over $6 million of loans. And the default rate has been 6%. And virtually everyone who has defaulted has died. So you know you can't blame them. I'm just saying. They would have rather paid. Um, Detroit just started an $8 million loan program with Bank of America. And they went down to 560 credit score, were much more generous about income levels, and they have less than a 1% default rate. So this idea of if folks can, in fact, take out a loan, right? If you want to take out a $10,000 loan at 3% interest, which is what Philly agreed to, it's about $99 a month. If they have that in their budget, and some don't, I absolutely understand, some need grants, it's a really extraordinary tool to basically make sure they have access to the capital they need. So, talk tough, change culture, follow up, offer some financial incentives. And what I'm finding is it makes an incredible difference. It changes the neighborhood, it changes the environment. And you would be amazed at how responsive new businesses are because they see it as a sign that they should come in, new residents, and everyone feels better for all the reasons Brian talked about, about we want to be in good places that are well tended and well cared for. So thank you. Are we working now? Yay, thank you. OK, questions? Come on. <laughs> I have one specifically around a blight that are caused by major storms. That's something that I know the community that I worked in, when there were major storms, a lot of trees down. The town was not addressing it. It was kind of like, deal with it yourself. But there were folks, in particular, seniors living in the community that just can't. And so they would kind of put it out by the road. It's now been there for about six months probably isn't going anywhere. Are there strategies you would recommend for things like that where either the government can get involved or grants that are available to address those issues? So it's really interesting, great question. So most of the places I work in, 
it has been a slow boil. Blight has been occurring over 50 years and increasing over time. When we were looking for solutions, we looked at disaster recovery, right? Because that's the very opposite thing, which is whoop, one storm knocks out everything. How do you get it up and running? And we did that in order to try to get it to scale. And so this loan program that I just told you about called the Healthy Row House Project, it is going to have 20 different contractors. It is going to have the ability to go into 20 homes at a time. It's going to have teams. It is going to start fixing up houses as if it was a disaster, if that makes any sense. But at the same time, um, when disasters happen, whether you think the federal government is responsive or not, you have just unlocked a whole series of new resources. And so the, the places that have had major disasters tend to be able to get help from FEMA, tend to be able to get some help if they are insured or not. Um, and traditional blight that happens over time, you can't. I can tell you that there are communities that have suffered major, major losses, and they're talking about maybe never recovering. Um, some communities in North Carolina, two years ago, everything was wiped out. They were still in the process of constructing it. Um, and so tools, right, these tools really are about creating more responsible owners and better properties. And you can't do that with these tools if there's a disaster. You actually need the National Guard to come in, the resources to come in to fix it. Would that folks agree? Does that make sense? Okay. Additional questions? Don't make me pick on you. Uh, okay, I have an observation. Oh, we'll get you touched on some I'd rather not. Okay. I think you touched on some very sensitive issues. The reason the town or the planners have failed the community to create the you know depreciation of properties and the vacancies leans toward the government, the local politics, and the planners that have allowed their community to degrade to a level where investors that own rental properties no longer have the potential to have a decent income or to have the monies to improve the property. So by applying rules, regulations, fines, and demanding they fix properties that have no potential for income seems to be a little abrasive to me. And at the same time, it's kind of contradicting because the community needs to rise up and grow and not necessarily attack people that own properties that have declined because the community or the state failed them. I mean, people didn't just leave Philly because there was some sort of blight going around. I mean, they community failed them. I mean, the job opportunities left, you know, income potentials. I think that that's a big, big issue. So this was a really good point, which is the community, the government, hasn't really taken any action all this time. And as a result, all the property values are depressed, and the interest in renting properties are depressed, and the visitor levels are depressed. And now you're going to go to an owner and say, yep, your property is barely profitable, but we want you to make all the investments. And is that fair? Or is that abrasive? Um, and you know, in the law, right, law school, there's the reasonable man standard, right, which is what would a reasonable man do in this situation, right? Would they jump out of a moving train? Because now they're suing the train company because they broke their leg on the way down, right? And the court would say, no, like a reasonable person doesn't do that, but a reasonable person does try to get into the train doors just before they close, and when their leg is cut off in doing so, well, the train is liable, right? What, what is reasonable, what isn't reasonable is really, really important. And for this situation, the reality is that there has to be a culture shift. And yes, it would be great to turn the time machine back and always hold owners to standards and hold them to standards when it wouldn't have cost that much because things were just starting to fall apart, things were just starting to deteriorate. But the whole idea of this kind of performance measure, gradation, treating owners differently, giving them lots of warnings, is to not be punitive. To not say, you know what? 
every single thing in the code has equal importance. You cannot put a broom on your front porch because a broom doesn't belong there. It says so in the code. Who cares if there's a broom on the front porch? But if there is basically 18 garage sales worth of stuff on the front porch, that's something worth dealing with. And you aren't asking people to deal with it today. You're asking them to give you a plan for how they're going to deal with it over the next few months. And you're trying to help. And communities have been really, really amazing. The resources they found for hoarders, because that's a big problem, people who hoard internally, externally. Um, there are communities all over the country that have community colleges that have geriatrics programs that are working with seniors that go out and help them make these small repairs. Um, there are programs to make the house accessible so that when seniors end up in a wheelchair, they can access everything. And the cost is not that high, right? For $2,400, you can make a home accessible. For $1,000, you can take a terrible, gross, disgusting, vacant lot full of stuff and turn it into a little parklet and an asset for the community just by planting grass and a few plants and getting rid of the stuff. And you know what? They don't dump again. Once it's tended, they, the neighbors, the people who would come and make a mess don't because it's a well-tended area. So finding these things, we're also working with healthcare to get them to finance some of this because the healthcare industry benefits greatly when patients with chronic disease like respiratory illness don't have to be readmitted because Medicare and some others, they can't get repaid for that. And so to take care of a child who can't breathe and keeps coming to the emergency room isn't going to help if, in fact, their house has mold and black spots all over and carpeting that's making them ill. So going in and for a few hundred dollars ripping that up, getting rid of the mold, repainting, the studies show, this. I'm not making this stuff up, this is real. You can increase their school attendance by 200%. You can decrease their emergency room visits by 75 to 85%. And that's not a lot to do. And it is not going to resolve every code violation. And this Healthy Row House project, we had to get the city to agree that if somebody got a loan to fix their roof, they weren't going to go in and say, OK, I'm inspecting everything. And you have knob and tube wiring, and that's illegal. And you're going to have to spend $35,000 fixing your electric system. So all of this is to say, not one answer, not draconian enforcement. But you know what? You got to say, this isn't OK. We have to change it. Because if you don't, nothing is going to change. And you've got some great tools, like the land bank, to take the worst of the worst and then help some of the other folks along until every main street and every residential area is one that I want to go move into with my children. Because this place is gorgeous, right? The, you just have these beautiful, beautiful communities and such natural beauty. And it's just getting control and saying, property owners, you actually have an obligation. And the difference that that can create is remarkable. Mm -hmm. As it falls under the category of you got to start somewhere, right? Yes, you do. Uh, we had a question here. You talked a bit about banks cooperating with some of these programs. What do you do with banks foreclosed properties? I happened to have lived next to one 10 years ago, and this bank, we offered to buy it. And it was like, oh, it's being managed by someone. They seem happier to just sit on these things and let them rot than move them. How do you deal with that? OK, so um, jurisdictions have done great things in that regard that have had huge impacts. So one is foreclosure registration. So there are several companies, Safeguard is one of them, I should probably say at least two or three others so I don't seem to favor one, but I can't think of them at the moment, um, where they get the information from the bank and then they send a bank notice on your behalf. They take half of the foreclosure registration fee to do this, but it's all privatized, and they say to the bank, in our community, when you have a foreclosed property, we expect you to take care of it, and this is what we expect from you. We want you to mow it. We want you to take care of it. We want you to get rid of all the plywood. We want you to turn off the water. We want you to deal with the 
a pool that's a hazard, um, and all of these things, and it's self-financing, right, because of foreclosure registration. We've also found that banks do not have as big an appetite as they used to for owning properties in all of these communities. And so negotiations one-on-one -on -one have made a difference, and there are two national organizations that will help you negotiate, and we can talk about that. But the idea is to get them into something like a land bank where you can say, hey, here is a property, or even better, in the hands of a developer or a homeowner who will turn that property into an asset. But banks have really turned a corner because the press was so bad and because the worst of the properties we call zombie properties because they foreclosed, the, pro the owner left thinking that they had lost the property and they never completed the foreclosure process. So now they don't own it. The owner doesn't think they own it. No one's ever gonna fix it. And in three decades, we're gonna be talking about that property. That can't be the case, right? Once you have all your properties that have problems into an Excel spreadsheet, you'd be amazed at the tools you can use to address each one. But first, you need to know what kind of property, what its problems are, and who owns it. And then you can find the right tool to make a difference. Very good. Additional questions? Oh, Jill, you're going to make me run, aren't you? <laughs> all right, watch me. No, it's a. Uh, Again, the microphone is not necessarily for you guys to hear. It's for us to pick up on the recording. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, I have a question. We had a housing roundtable yesterday um, where we talked about one of our biggest needs was substandard rentals and, and going after it. So the rental inspection database would be great. Do, do you find that there is a transition or a concern of if you're starting to now condemn some of these properties and pushing these tenants out that they don't have a place to go to live? because there's no other good housing available. OK, this is really important. So Detroit, and Detroit is the outlier, right? Detroit has the worst of the worst, right? They had a single industry that went out of business, basically. And they have so much vacancy, it's incredible. And they decided just this year to start inspecting rental properties. And um, they did not make any attempt to allow tenants to say for some period of time if they revoked that landlord's license. And as a result, there's been some displacement. And we don't know how much, but I'm actually talking to them to try to get those numbers, because I think that's a problem. What other places have done is they have said, if you are in violation, first of all, you have six months before we will fully revoke your license. And we're gonna come in after three months and see that you've addressed all the safety and health things. And then at six months, if this is a place that is unsafe and unhealthy for these tenants, we are going to try to help find them other places to live. Because um, that's the, the worst of the worst. And, and as I say, I've been doing this work a long time, and I went to UCLA Law School, and my first case was against a slumlord. And he had 300 units. And when I said, well, let's go after him, they said, no. You go after him, and you're going to have 300 households who don't have a home. And that was, I don't want to tell you how long ago law school was, but a long time ago. Um, and what ended up happening was this landlord was told that he was on the way to losing all his properties, all 300 units. And that was made really, really clear. And he did fix them up. Now, were they gorgeous housing? No. But they were safe for folks to live in. Another thing I've got to tell you is what Dallas did which was really effective, and I don't know if it would work here, so you guys have to tell me, but I really liked it, which is when Dallas started enforcing these the code against rental properties, they collected the worst of the landlords, like the folks who had several properties in bad condition. And the mayor invited them to come meet him in his office and said, you know what, we are fixing up our housing because we know it's making our people sick, because we know it's hurting our economy, because we know it's hurting our neighborhoods. Will you join the mayor's team? I'm sure he did it better than I did, right, because he's a politician. And only one landlord said no. 
and to join the mayor's team and be on the landlord advisory committee, he just had to deal with each of these code violations. And it was an interesting carrot because suddenly they were invited to places, right, as, ooh, this is a good landlord. And all they had to do was become a good landlord to do it. And that was enough motivation for them. So carrots and sticks. Mm -hmm. Did that, they also get matching t-shirts? Because that probably would have helped too. T-shirts always <laughs> help. T-shirts <laughs> exactly. always help. Or a little swag here and there, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, any other uh, questions? Otherwise, um, I'm gonna close by picking on Brian. <laughs> so Brian, could you talk a little bit about the Town of Liberty? Because the Town of Liberty has contracted, oh yeah, all the other Brian's in the room were like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> So um, Liberty uh, recently made a switch uh, to contracted uh, code enforcement and has had some um, success in dealing with the issue and cooperating between the town and the village. And I just wanted you to maybe share some of your experiences really quick. Sure. Um, well, first of all, yeah, the, the town contracted with a private uh, engineering firm and our Al Fusco from Goshen was, uh, was here earlier. And, um, so he has, you know, a bunch of professionals that perhaps um, more manpower than a single code enforcement officer could could uh, accomplish here in Liberty. So um, that was before my time, so I certainly can't, you know, uh, comment on the, the whole progression of it. Um, but, you know, just like, uh, like a, any code enforcement officer, they have their limitations too. You know, there's a lot to do up here. But um, I think what it did bring to the table was a, you know, a higher level of um, expertise and, and uh, being engineers and such. So, so that has uh, helped. Um, but uh, more exciting was a program we put together this year with the Village of Liberty and Pam Winters, the code enforcement officer from the village is here. And I want to say hello to her and thank her for her cooperation in this. <laughs> um, and that the town of Liberty and the village of Liberty reached an agreement that allowed the town of Liberty code enforcement people to cite violations on the, in the village of Liberty. Um, so, and, and our focus was on Main Street this, uh, this summer and it was part of our um, Renaissance program, and we thank the Renaissance people for encouraging it and, and helping fund it. And, um, and Fusco actually donated money to do this as well. And the idea is to, you know, really to hit on the, uh, the low-hanging fruit, the obvious code violations that we saw on Main Street, and um, just like an intensive effort to uh, try to get people's attention, try to get these things changed quickly to give, you know, as much visual appeal as we can on, on our street. So, um, so far, I think we've, um, we have 16 cases in court, I believe, or from that effort that may not have been there otherwise because um, as terrific as Pam Winters is, I mean, she's very uh, overtaxed with uh, handling the village single-handedly, which is which is quite a challenge. So, um, in addition to what Pam has done, and she do has done a lot. She has a lot of cases in court, <laughs> uh, but the the town has now added 16 more cases in court. Not that court is the only answer. We want to do a lot of these other nice fluffy things, and um, we're all for that. But um, right now, we're we're in the trenches uh, trying to to get people's attention. So that has been, you know, a real, um, you know, we're not seeing overnight success with it, but it's it's something we're, we're hoping uh, will catch on and it's um, about, you know, if, if nothing else, it's municipal cooperation, which is uh, unique, right? <laughs> anyway, thank you, Helen. Well, thank you. All right, if there's no other questions, can we give Karen a big uh, round of applause? <laughs> Okay.
I want to thank both of our speakers for, um, for coming out here today. Hopefully you learned a little something. I want to do just a quick plug um, for Sullivan Renaissance. As, as Brian mentioned, um, a lot of people um, view Sullivan Renaissance as the flower police, right? We're the people that are out there, you know, giving people money to plant flowers. Uh, but we're more than just that. The programs that I manage are really geared towards municipalities, and we offer um, grants to incentivize some of the things that Brian and Karen talked about here today. So if you have an idea for um, a project to enhance a public space, um, if you need additional personnel um, to maintain your public spaces, um, if you need to buy software to uh, start a database of problem uh, properties, um, if you need additional help, um, we have grants that can help municipalities uh, tackle beautification, maintenance of public spaces, healthy communities, and code enforcement. So um, talk to me later if you have an idea, because we're now gearing up for our 2019 um, funding round. So I just want to close by saying I know a lot of the ideas that you hear that you heard here today from both speakers um, are much larger in scope, um, geared towards urban environments. But you know, take some of that information back with you. See how it could apply in your own communities. And as a wise man uh, who is seated in the room here today, but shall not be named, once said, uh, "Think big, start small, do something." So thank you.